What's up? What's up, y'all? Back at it once again. The Coach Gift Fun Day kicking in for you and for yours. And um, you know what I'm saying? Why I'm doing this, let's give a shout out to my ancestors. Give me the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And also, I'd like to get a shout y'all for looking, watching, you know, making it do what it do. You know, thank y'all for sharing my videos and doing you no know, stuff like that, you know, and promoting me. I really appreciate it. The channel been growing. I've been doing this thing. So I'm playing. That's why I hear comes from New Zealand. You know, I'm getting kind of some flack from New Zealand, but we ain't gonna talk about it in this video. And this one's called Blackbirding, New Zealand's shameful role in the Pacific Islands slave trade. This came out January 7, 2017. This country's shameful and long forgotten role in the Pacific Island slave trade has been revealed in a new book, The Stolen Island, Search for the Ata. June 1863, the Grecian 27 meter railing ship painted material black and white anchors off the western coast of Ata, a small rocky island far south of the Tango of Archipelago. The captain, Tasmanian whaler Thomas McGrath, yells as an invitation to assemble the islanders to come on board to trade. Nothing unusual here. The Ata population is usually about 300 and are used to trade with passing vessels, pigs, chicken, sugarcane, yam, and potatoes for rum, tobacco, knives, pipes, hooks, and holes. Almost 150 men, women, and children paddle out to the ship. Some swim. On board, they are by to share a feast, or some will say view the wares, below deck. And as soon as they descend downstairs, the trap doors slam shut, and the ship sails away with about half the population that acts up locked in this hole. Jump forward 150 years. New Zealand poet and historian Scott Hamilton was teaching at Tonga Tana Institute, Institute of New Alpha. He took a group of students to the Atta Islands, where the remaining Atta had been evacuated to more than a century earlier, establishing their own settlement named Holo Malaymane after the village they left behind. Intrigued by this strange chapter in Tongan history, he rifled through the square text in the Antensi Library and uncataloged shelves, searching Tongan stolen by Thomas McGrath. Using dialogue connection in internet cafes, back in New Zealand, he scored the 19th century newspaper articles, shipping reports, genealogical records, and missionary diaries, and a bid that unraveled a mystery of the stolen islanders. I became obsessed with the Atta, he said. Hamilton returned home. Returned, excuse me, Hamilton returned to Tonga in 2015 with his wife and his two sons, hoping to argument his academic approach to research. And in 2009, he completed his PhD on British historian, political and peace activist and writer E.P. Tonkin with local stories shared over family meals and around a bowl of kava bowl. There are two different types of history. There's history on paper and there's history on people's mouths. I didn't know how to reconcile them. I bounced from one to another, but I really tried hard in a book not to pretend of something I'm not. I am a Pelagi though, through and through, and not an insider, but an outsider. The book Stone Island tracks the Grecian ferry through its, from its departure from Hobart in December 1861 to a stopover in Wellington in early 1863, where most of the crew promptly deserted. Using profits from the sale of whale oil, McGrath stocked up on food and liquor before sailing east to Chatham Islands, where he recruited a score of new hands, including two Portuguese, a group of Maori, to hunt whales along the New Zealand, new Zealand coast. But instead of starting north into tropical waters, somewhere between Gourmetis and Atta, he told his crew, the whaling trade had become unprofitable because the whale had become harder and harder to find. There was much more money in selling slaves to plantations in the states of Peru than hunting fish. Eight of his crew refused to be part of the slave trading operation. They were dumped in the Samoa island of Tutalia and leaving a crew of only 16. After the Atta raid, the crew tried the same tactics at Nuba Fortune 
where 30 more islanders were enticed into the Grecian hold. From there, McGrath set sail for the Peruvian slave market at Calico, nicknamed the Jaws of Hell. On the way, he sold captives to Peruvian slave ship Jerome Prim. According to the diplomatic report, 174 colonists arrived from the islands of Frenetine, presumably a Peruvian mistransportation of, of Friendly, on July 9th, 1863. By then, however, the Peruvian government had established a law, had abolished the law allowing the slave people of the Pacific. The Antas, along with several hundred other captives, were locked in a warehouse where many succumbed to smallpox epidemics ravaging the city. Others, write Hamilton, may have died from sheer despair. In the store rooms of the plantation, the Atta and the attics of Grand Homes, the islanders laid down and waited for death. Neither whip nor bread would make them work. Conflicting memories. On October that year, 429 islanders were put into the Aberdeen of the Anton Latin. But rather than returning with his alien passage to their homeland as promised, the captain abandoned them on an the island to the Cocos near Costa Rica. Some weeks later, a Peruvian warship picked up 38 who had not succumbed to smallpox and left them in Patia, the far north of Peru. From here, the trail peters out, a score by conflicting memories, rumors, and superstition. Some say the stolen Anta was taken to the U.S. According to one source, they lived in America. Their descendants still live in America. They have their own society there. There is a blazing report of a man on the banks of the Panama Canal telling passing seamen, I am Tongan, I am Atta from the island of Atta. There are clues to some of the return to the South Pacific, perhaps hitching a ride with U.S. soldiers during World War II secretly returning them to the Kalamale to give money to their relatives. South American coins have been found in Polynesian. However, were they recognized if they returned secretly? The Islands have six fingers on their hands, he was told, and six toes on each foot. In 1936, a French yacht who met a woman on the island of Rippy Aten who she said is descended from the former slaves taken from the Tonga Island of Nua Nepapatu to South America. In 1863, the former slave ship Barbara Gomez returned a small number of indentured and captured slaves to the island of Ripinu and Ripitidin. In 1945, an early German recalled me a Tonga man in Auckland Island in 1894. The man explained him an Anton who had been kidnapped, taken to Chile, not Peru, and made the work 15 years before escaping to Auckland. And McGrath, after he sold his slaves to General Prime, the report placed him chasing whales in Fiji, sending down the South Island's west coast and anchoring on rules of Stewart Islands, and then sent it to Campbelltown, later Buff, where he was arrested and found guilty not of slave trading, but of bre custom breaches. In 1881, a Hobart newspaper reported a whaler, John McGrath, traveled to Tahiti where his father, Thomas, was ill. A certificate record shows that Thomas James McGrath died in Papi the next following year. Hamilton tracked down McGrath's great-great-grandson in Tasmania, who gave him an undated photo of his bad, nasty ancestor. I suggest that he might come to Tonga with me, writes Hamilton, and drink kava with the descendants of survivor of the Atta Raid on Atta. But McGrath's great great grandson stopped replying to his emails. And as you see, there's a picture of Thomas McGrath. Hard labor. The Stolen Island is a gripping and appalling story of an ethnographic mystery told with urgency of Coldray Age Manor. But the ripples from these events extend far beyond a rare teardrop and the screen of blue that marks the Atta on the world. In the early 20th, 19th, and 20th century, thousands of islands were transferred from their homes to plantations in towns in Queensland, Fiji, Tahiti, and New Caledonia. Some went willingly 
to escape war or social disgrace. Others were kidnapped or tricked into signing contracts that commanded them years of, be of higher labor with little reward. By the end of the 1870s, Queensland's extensive cotton and sugar plantations had earned a nickname the Second Louisiana, following the emancipation of the Southern slaves in the United States. Some plantation owners fled to South America and the Pacific, trying to recreate the society they had lost. In his book, White Pacific, Sidebird, we're gonna get, I'm gonna get this book. I'm gonna get this book, White Pacific. In the book, White Pacific, Gerald Horn described as Confederates as telling a branch of the Ku Klux Klan in Fiji. Mm. It was called blackbirding. This Pacific trade of slaves after a strong word for the abduction of aboriginals. And New Zealand played an active part. Cutters, catchers, sooners, and later larger slips, ships left New Zealand ports for archipelagos, including New Herbicides and the Solomons, forcing and conning islanders into vessels and then delivering to planters in Queensland or Fiji. In 1868, John Thurston, the British consul on Fiji, reported that nine New Zealand ships had recently called what they called there with human cargo. A year later, his successor listed that another seven New Zealand owned black burning vessels active in Fiji. New Zealand also served as a distinction destination. Helmson described the eighth 19th century photograph showing a group of men, black skin, standing approximately at the flax mill on a hancha, on a hanakaken. Yeah. Records show that in 1870, 27 men from the New Hemerson, New Herberside, now the Bantu Islands of Efe, had arrived on Lulu, a sooner owned and operated by an explorer, Francis Cadell, who later commanded a ship during the Wakaku War, supposedly agreeing to work for three years in exchange for 10 pounds worth of traded goods. When work at the fax mill dried up, the efforts were sent to the states of one of wealthy Auckland businessmen. I was beginning to look at Auckland differently, right, Hamilton. How many of the, grand, of, the cities, of the city's grand 19th century buildings, the places that are now art galleries, museums, and five-star sanatoriums have been prisoners for imported laborers? How many wharves or boat yards have been laid out with profits from blackbirding? Where were the plaques, the museum exhibits, and that account for this history? There was an outrage of our time, New Zealand Herald insisted. No one can pretend these niggers are here of their own, of their free will. But the writer's main concern was not exploitation, but the manners and the habit of these woolly barbarians. I suppose I always unconsciously brought forth the notion that New Zealand being better than Australia or America and not having that slavery history, said Hamilton. It was further depressing to discover a lot of opposition to slavery was motivated by feelings of racial repugnance. A black crowd. On the Reading the Map blog, Hamilton quotes poet Kendrick Smithman, the map says the road ends here, not true. There is more research to do in the Pacific slave trade in the play of the Anton Tarnas Hints, says Hamilton. That could be the dead ends or something more. You really have to run in the alley to find out if it's a blind alley. But in the unraveling, the least part of the story of missing Atas, Hamilton hoped to alleviate the burden and the shame borne by many descendants. There are people who have been carrying a weight around their backs for almost 154 years and continues to be a black cow over whole families. In this book, he repeats the stories told to him by Iwa, the Pelagi slaver paid Paula Vang, the Atta chief, or the Punta Dhan, to help him steal Atta people, and that he was an Atta Judas. The mantle of blame he found still lies within Vela's descendants. Talkins have a word called Lave Kawobi, meaning bad gossip. I hope that by using the archives, I can produce some evidence and take some lava cololi away, take the burden away from some people who have been blamed for the tragedy. It is a certain thing that Billy was liaisoning with these whalers. 
but I think he became a scapegoat for their disaster. Similarly, women of Ata descent are teased about their ancestors selling their women to whalers. But in a whaler's journal, Hamilton found evidence to the contrary. He visited Ata in the 1840s, and he said it's very hard to get a woman here. You basically have to marry them. The book will also, he hopes, address the complex process of forgetting that the previous buried New Zealand role in the Pacific slave trade. This might pave the way for public acknowledgement and our involvement, but not necessarily by the way of our apology, but, but perhaps a memorial on the rate of Asa and other delegations New Zealanders were involved in the black burning trade. He likens it to Dick Scott's 1975 work on the Batilla, as that mountain, which was once a secure piece of history, is now a recognized chapter in our story. Such announcement, he believes, will also encourage a review on how the New Zealand treated Pacific people today. He described the experience of several thousands of men Bantu who come to New Zealand to work in vine yards and kiwi fruit orchards, though the recognized seasonal employee scheme. In Bantu, I became aware of how important the RSC scheme is to their economy. It's everyone's dream to get in the scheme, yet many people are exploited and have unhappy experiences. If we could change our view of the Pacific and see the Pacific people as part of our neighborhood, not the other, we will welcome them here as when they come to work in an RSC scheme, rather than what we do at present, such as denying them public health care, making them take out private health care insurance, and pay them just minimum wage. It sounds pompous, but I feel I've been in a bit on a journey and imagine to, and used to imagine New Zealand was floating in the ocean somewhere between Britain and America. Now I, feel, I strongly feel we are part of the Pacific. We are a Pacific nation. And there you have it, you know. So yes, New Zealand was deep in the slave trade, a slave to over um, Melanesians or Africans in the Pacific, just, you know, just a short term. I'm not gonna get hit for that word, but I'm gonna use it anyway. Africans in the Pacific, you know. But as they got tapped over in these islands and stuff like that. So, and also how um, it talks about the El Minas, the Fort Myers they had over here, the ones in Peru that's not really talked about on the west coast of the United States of, of, uh, of America, you know. And how Confederates left, how some Confederates left and after the Civil War in the United States, and we set up shop in Brazil, Cuba, and New Zealand, you know, New Zealand and Australia and stuff like that. So they set up new shops and stuff and just took the slave trade with them in other places. So I really didn't die like that, you know what I'm saying? They just kept the, the behavior going. As my man said, they even had a uh, form the Ku Klux Klan. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy. They even formed a Ku Klux Klan in Fiji. So they was not playing around, you know. But it's something that's not talked about. You know, we do African history, or history of people, we gotta do the history of it worldwide. We just can't leave people out of it, you feel me? You know, we just can't leave people, I don't leave our, our people hanging because they live in a different part of the ocean. Like Dr. John Henry Clark said, they could be in the islands of the Caribbean, islands of the Pacific, on the continent of Africa, on the continent of Asia, on the continent of Americas, on the continent of Australia, or the subcontinent of India. We're all one people. You understand me? If anybody got a problem with that, what the coast is suddenly saying, I'm going to say the same thing my answer to Dr. John Henry Clark say, you can go straight to hell. Now, hopefully you subscribe to the channel. Much love to you and yours on the New Zealand slave trade in the Pacific. We're going to have some more on this too. But much love to you and yours. Um, subscribe to the channel. Um, hey, if you want to donate to the movement, the Cash App of Koski, you know what I'm saying? And um, much love to you and yours, because this is what we're doing. Peace.